Father, we're here, sometimes tired and sinful and bloodied and afraid and lonely, but we're here. And we wait for the soft sound of sandaled feet. Father, during this time, remind us again of your faithfulness, your sufficiency, and your love. And remind us also that if you had never come, if you had never loved us, you're still God and you're worthy of our worship. Eternal, infinite, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, immutable. And now, Father, we pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins, because there are many we would see Jesus and him only. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. A couple of weeks ago, Kathy uh, said to me, you need to get a title together for Willow Creek. And I had no idea what I was going to do, but I was reading at the time an email I want to read to you. And just so you know, I got the permission from the guy who wrote this. I told him that if he let me use it, Nobody would ever know his name. And if he wanted, I would make him into a woman, Caitlin. And he would, uh, and nobody would know. And he said, feel free, Steve. He said, if my testimony in the heart of my darkness helps others, I'm pleased to do it. But if you turn me into a woman, you'll get the hives. Hello, Steve. My name is, and I wanted to send you my question. You guys have always been a huge help to me in my times of need, so thank you. I found myself in the middle of ongoing sin, and I can't shake the guilt and the shame. My first reaction is to beat myself up because I should have known better not to do it. Steve, I'm so embarrassed. I don't know why I can't get over this one struggle. Every time I do screw up, I question God's love for me as if it was dependent on me and how I'm doing. I began to believe the lies that God is just waiting for me to get it right before he gives me peace again and accepts me again. I, of course, repent after I screw up and ask for forgiveness, but I'm overwhelmed with the thoughts that I'm not doing something right. So I think God is waiting for me to figure it out before he forgives me. Every time I seem to be doing good and getting it right, I just fall again. Then I feel as if I have to make up everything I had accomplished before. I know all of this isn't right and God doesn't work this way, but I can't get all this out of my head. I've been learning so much lately and then I sin and then I fall. I think this is how you thank God for what he's doing in your life. Jesus has been so good to me lately and I just keep falling. Does he still love me? I want nothing more than to follow Jesus and love him, to know he loves me, but just keep, can't keep on doing it much longer. I fail so often, and I struggle to get up. Can you help me? Of course I can help him. I'm ordained. <laughs> 
And if I can't, Jesus can. Open your Bible, if you will, to the Gospel according to Luke, the 22nd chapter, and I'm going to start reading at the 24th verse. This is a wonderful text because it's a curious mix, bookmarked with sin and praise in the middle. Listen to what Luke writes. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them should be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become the youngest. And the leader is one who serves. For who is the greater? One who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Oh, my. Let me go down one side road before we get to the main thrust of this text, and I help Kevin out. Um, I want you to note the dispute in the first part of the text that arose between the disciples. Can you believe those turkeys? <laughs> They've been with Jesus for three years. He's getting ready to go to the cross. His teaching has been a part of their lives all of this time, and they're having an argument about who will be the greatest. We do that too. We're just more subtle about it. We very quietly hang degrees on walls. We bring up names in conversation. We pad resumes, and we want people to notice. Did you? hear about the Methodist bishop that was invited to the church of a young pastor and only four people showed up. And the bishop leaned over to the young pastor and said, son, did you tell him I was going to be here? And he said, no, sir, but I think it got out. <laughs> it was the best thing that had happened to that bishop in a long time. I have a dear friend and I took him with me in another state. We were traveling to a radio studio, and I noticed that a celebrity, and you would know his name if I were to mention it, which I'm not, but he's quite famous. He's written a lot of books. He's a lot better looking than me and far more articulate with more degrees than I have. And so I thought that when I introduced my friend, his name is Jim, to this particular man, that my own PR would go up because I knew this guy. And so I said, uh, Jim Youngblood, he's a dentist. I want you to meet, and I introduced him to this man. And then Jim, God bless him, said, I'm sorry, what... Uh, what was your name again? <laughs> and he gave his name and his degree. And then Jim said, and what is it you do? <laughs> 
And the man blanched. And later on, Jim said, I'm so sorry, Steve. I honestly didn't know who he was. And I said, Jim, that was the best thing that had happened to that man in a very long time. Now, I'm going to give you a principle, and it's a very important principle. The disciples should have known it. There is an inverse and direct correlation between how much you know you're loved and valued by Jesus and how little you care about getting it somewhere else. You said, Steve, would you repeat that one more time? I will, and slower for the slower among us. There is a direct and inverse correlation between how much you know how you are loved and valued by Jesus and how little you care about it from somebody else. The disciples should have known that. Okay, to the main thrust of the text. Do you know why pagans don't become Christians? They will tell you they have intellectual problems, but that's bull. They will name the hypocrites in the church, and that is nonsense. The reason they don't want to be Christian is because of their sin. We have the rep of being good, and they know they're not good. And at night, just before they go to sleep, they know that. Now, you know what I just taught you. But let me tell you something maybe you didn't know. The reason people leave the church and the Christian faith isn't intellectual. It's not because of a sermon that was preached by the pastor. It's not because of bad music. It's not because they've been hurt. They leave because of sin. Sometimes it's in denial, but it's still sin. I've told you before about a note I received a number of years ago from a young lady in our church. She said, Steve, I'm leaving, and I didn't want you to hear it from somebody else. She said, I've tried, and I've tried really hard, but I can't be good enough. I tried to call her, but her phone was disconnected, and I've never seen her again. I guess the reason I tell that so often in so many places is that I have this fading hope that she will be there and she will hear what I'm about to say. But I'll tell you something, after talking to literally thousands and thousands of people, I see it all the time. I just can't do it anymore. I can't be as good as those other people. I can't be faithful. I, as the guy who wrote the email, just keep falling. And I'm so ashamed. And I'm so embarrassed. I suspect that most of you feel that way occasionally, too. And I'm here to help. So I moved the previous question. What do you do when you can't be good enough? I don't know, frankly. But I know, but I know from this text what you shouldn't do. First, if you're in that state, and a lot of you are right now, if you're in that state, for God's sake, don't leave. Jesus, notice in the text, said, you guys have been with me in all of my trials from the beginning. He didn't say you've been good and pure and nice and faithful. You were just fighting about who was the greatest. But you didn't leave. And you've been with me from the beginning. So for God's sake, don't leave. This morning, I've been talking with a man who is talking about committing suicide. I don't know whether he was manipulating me. I don't know whether he was angry at his wife. 
His life has not gone the way he wanted it to go. And he said to me, I'm just going to end it. And I did what my, I teach my students to do in those occasions. I told him, don't lay that on me. If you need some bullets, I'll send them to you. And then I said, but don't do this. It is so selfish and so self-serving, and it affects generations of your family. And I know because it affected mine, so please don't do this. You are gifted, and you're winsome, and you're bright, but it's final, and you ought to stay around and see how this thing works out. I don't know what I'll hear when this service is over. But what I said to him is very true. When you're down, you think you'll never be up again. And when you're up, you think you'll never be down again. But whatever you do, don't leave. I was talking to Paul Tripp, the psychologist, in one of our Sunday school classes. They're studying his book. I love him. He's the real deal. And we were talking about some mutual friends who are having some serious marriage problems. And I said, look, I know you're supposed to say God can work miracles, but aside from the religious stuff, what about this marriage? Is it going to make it? And he said, sometimes the accusations are so ripe and the anger so real and the condemnation everywhere that when you walk far enough down that road, you can't get back. I'm going to write a book on marriage on my deathbed. You never know. We've been married 50-something years, but, you know, Anna still sometimes gets frustrated with me. She, she could say, I've had it, man. I can't do this anymore and leave, and I'd look like a real hypocrite with my book on marriage. <laughs> but she can't divorce you after you're dead. By the way, the staff at Key Life are preparing for DD Day, the day Steve drools or dies. And just before, I hope Jesus gives me time to write that book. It'll only have two words. And the two words will be, don't leave. Just don't leave. When you leave, Jesus still loves you. He won't let you go. He won't be angry with you, and you won't surprise him, but you won't be able to see what he does. So if you're in that place, for God's sake, don't leave. Secondly, you shouldn't leave, but for God's sake, don't lie. Just don't lie. Um, Please note in the text, Jesus just said to Peter, you, Satan is out to get you. Peter said, I don't care, I'm strong. Satan is out to get you, but don't worry, I pray that your faith wouldn't fail. And when you have turned, comfort your brothers and your sisters. And then Peter, and Peter should have just shut up. Peter said, that's not true. I'll go to prison, and I'll even die for you. And Jesus could have said, shut up. Just shut up, but he didn't. He said, oh, Peter, before the sun comes up, you will deny me three times. You know where you should lie if you're going to lie? Lie out there to pagans, okay? Whatever you do, don't lie to each other. And more important than that, don't lie to yourself. When you pray the psalm, see if there be any evil in me. Don't wince because you're held and you're loved and you can do that. Ask God to show you who you really are, how unfaithful you really are, how disobedient you would be if you got an opportunity, where you would go if you knew you wouldn't get caught, what you would read and look at 
if it weren't for your wife or your husband. Don't ever, ever lie to yourself. And why is that? Because God can't help people who can't tell the truth to him and to themselves. The reason Jesus winced and made it so clear to Peter and even embarrassed him in front of the other disciples before whom Peter had been proclaiming his greatness is because Jesus knew if Peter didn't understand the darkness, he would never see the light. And so there's a sense in which not getting better is a gift to you if you know it. I don't care where you've gone or what you've done or what you think or what you're drinking or what you're smoking or who you're sleeping with. Don't leave and don't lie. Don't lie to yourself or to him. In the darkest place he comes. Don't lie. Don't leave. And don't lament Please note that Jesus said, I'm praying for you, Peter. And if you turn, he didn't say that. He said, and when you turn, comfort your brothers. You remember in Mark 16, where the angel's talking to the women who have discovered the empty tomb and Jesus is resurrected. He said, go and tell the disciples. And specifically, the angel says, and don't forget to tell Peter that I'll meet them in Jerusalem. That is so good, I could hardly stand it. Jesus, Jesus said, don't be so black that you commit suicide. You don't have to leave, stay and watch what I'm going to do in your life. I'm fine, thank you. I really am. I lie a lot. In fact, in a sense, it's a lie for me to stand six feet above you to be called doctor or reverend or pastor, to teach in a seminary and write religious books and do religious broadcasts. Every time I do that, there's a sense in which I'm saying to you, I'm smart enough and good enough and pure enough to do this, and that's from the pit of hell, and it smells like smoke. I'm old. I thought I'd be better. And while I am... Not much. I think I'm over my anger and then I cuss and spit, make an obscene gesture in traffic and think, Jesus, are you through with me? I think, well, I'm not going to go any further because you're not that safe. But, <laughs> but that's a fact. You say, I bet you're really depressed. I bet you should call that guy you were talking to this morning. You all could hold hands and jump off a bridge together. No way. No way. You know why? Because Jesus thinks I'm something else. He likes me better than he likes you. I'm on his prayer list. He prays for me. He never says if. He says when. And he who began a good work and Steve Brown will bring it to completion. And someday I'm going to be just like Jesus. I went to the townhouse restaurant in Oviedo, Anna and I, last week. <laughs> That's the oldest restaurant there. And it's... Uh, we like going there. It's, I'm not exactly sure why. The food's good and people are fun. I think I like the signs they have all over the place. And when I, when I went up to the pay my check, there's a sign right above the cash register. And you know what it says? It says, put your big girl panties on and deal with it. <laughs> I was working on this sermon at that time and I thought, yeah. I don't know if that's appropriate to say in a pulpit, but that's what I've done. I've got my big girl panties on, and Jesus loves me a lot. 
and he's praying for me. And I don't care if you like me or not, I'm going to get better, and someday I'm going to be just like Jesus. And then finally, don't leave, don't lie, don't lament. And I swear I looked for another L for this final point and couldn't find it. <laughs> so this isn't going to fit in the alliteration. But don't waste your sin. Takes a drunk to help a drunk. AA's right. But it takes a real sinner, not a fake one, not one who does popcorn sins, but it takes a real sinner to help real sinners. So don't wait. This week, we interviewed uh, Sharon Hirsch, Kevin and I, and uh, one other guy, and we had a pastor's chat with Sharon, and she is wonderful. Man, she went through a divorce, and she's done everything wrong. In the middle of the interview, she said, back when I was an alcoholic, and I said, Sharon, you're a drunk too? And uh, the reason her books are so powerful, and the interview, and Kevin shaking his head, it really was. And the reason the interview was so strong and is going to help so many pastors is that Sharon doesn't wear any armor, and she uses her sin to reach out to God's people in a deep, and profound way. Can you imagine Peter writing those letters that are included in the New Testament? The good church members say, what's his letter doing in here, man? Three times he denied Jesus after being with him for three days, and then he ran in his moment of great need. And that wouldn't have been bad, but he was a hypocrite. He said he would never do it, and he did it. Exercise his letters from the Scripture. <laughs> but Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, didn't do that. Why? Because you need a sinner. Paul said in Galatians that Peter, and this was years after he had denied Christ, that Peter was a hypocrite. I'd have taken his letters out of the New Testament, but they didn't. You know why? Because they needed a sinner to speak to a sinner. And Peter was the man. So don't waste your sin. It's the gift you offer to your brothers and sisters in Christ. It gives great power to the words. Don't you leave. Don't you give up. Don't you get discouraged. Don't you despair. Jesus is praying for you, and I am too. I teach students in uh, preaching and communication classes not to close their sermons with a prayer. I tell them, in the prayer, you'll be tempted to fix what you screwed up in the sermon. It will cease to be a prayer, and by then, it will be too late. But I'm going to violate what I teach students, and I'm going to use somebody else's prayer. Uh, Kevin then will come up and pray and correct my sermon. <laughs> You've heard me, uh, and I mentioned it a couple of times, about my friend who has HIV. <coughs> He's given me permission, and I've done it. In fact, I dedicated my last book to him. It's hard to do that without everybody thinking you're gay, but I did anyway. <laughs> and, uh, and I did it because I love him so much, and I talked to him two or three times a week. And uh, he prayed for me, and he prayed the other day. And uh, I want to share the prayer that he prayed. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. By the way, thank you for praying for him. A number of you have asked me how he's doing, and he's still clinging to Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. Thank you for hearing the prayers of your people concerning my plight and for helping my body to heal you. 
Thank you for Steve and Key Life and the message that gives sinful ragamuffins like me hope for living and redemption. Thank you for the prayers of godly people who don't turn their backs on those who have fallen. Thank you, Father, for loving me and for not being like the God some taught me about, a God who only knows anger and shows only wrath towards sinners. Thank you, Jesus, for looking at my sinful life, seeing my hopeless state, and for coming to save me. Thank you most of all for not giving up on me when I'd given up on myself. Father, for mercy that is boundless and love that is fathomless and for grace that is limitless. How could he pray a prayer like that with HIV? If you listen to what I taught you, you know. You think about that. I'm in.